In H.P. Lovecraft's story, The Call of Cthulhu, one of the main sections is actually titled The Tale of Inspector Lagrasse. And there is, in fact, more going on in that than just the narrative that Lagrasse is going to provide us, but the bulk of it is centered around that. And why is that the case? Well, a little bit earlier in the first section, in going through his great uncle's stuff and finding this interesting set of manuscripts. There's two uh, sections to this manuscript. The first part is the dream and dream work of H.A. Wilcox. We've already looked at that. And then we have the narrative of Inspector John Lagrasse at 1908 AAS meeting notes on same and Professor Webb's account. So we're going to find out what's going on through a sort of uh, set of intermediaries. We've got Lagrasse himself who is providing, we could say eyewitness testimony of what is going on with this police raid on one branch of the Cthulhu cult, which is then being narrated or reported by Professor Engel, who is the narrator's great uncle. So we're getting it kind of at you know third hand ourselves, but it's provided in a very lively way that, that in some ways puts us there in the story many years before. So we find that this, um, you know, the American Archaeological Society is holding its annual meeting in St. Louis and Professor Angle is there and there's an outsider who is taking advantage of the convocation to offer questions for correct answering and problems for expert solution. That is what Lagrasse is doing there. He's traveled from New Orleans and he brings along uh, an apparently very ancient stone statuette whose origin he was at a loss to determine. And as we read, it must not be fancy that Inspector Lagrasse had the least interest in archaeology. On the contrary, his wish for enlightenment was prompted by purely professional considerations. The statuette, idol, fetish, or whatever it was, had been captured some months earlier in the wooded swamp south of New Orleans during a raid on a supposed voodoo meeting. And so singular and hideous were the rites connected with it, the police could not but realize they'd stumbled on a dark cult totally unknown to them. So he wants to get information from these archaeologists, these experts who are there, and we're actually going to learn, as we've talked about elsewhere, that this image is also found in other places where there are also cults that make the local people say, oh, stay away from that. That's truly evil. And so we find out that Professor Webb uh, ran into a similar cult with, in Greenland with uh, some of the Inuits. And Lagrasse is going to, as the narrator tells us, narrate the story as fully as possible to all of those who are gathered there. And this also includes yet another deeper layer of narrative as one of the prisoners, Castro, who is supposed to be an expert in these matters, explains over the course of about a page and a half, uh, the great old ones, the Cthulhu cult, and the lost sunken city of Relais. And we don't need to go into that. What we wanna look at is what actually happened. What does Lagrasse tell us about this? So on November 1st, 1907, there had come to New Orleans police a frantic summons from the swamp and lagoon country to the south. The squatters there, mostly primitive but good-natured descendants of Lafitte's men, were in the grip of stark terror from an unknown thing which had stolen upon them in the night. 
It was voodoo, apparently, but voodoo of a more terrible sort than they had ever known. Some of their women and children had disappeared since the malevolent Tom Tom had begun its incessant beating far within the black haunted woods where no dweller ventured. So there's, there's a sort of reign of terror going on. And they assume that it's voodoo, but it turns out it's not. It goes on, there were insane shouts and harrowing screams, soul-chilling chants and dancing devil flames. And the frightened messenger added that people could stand it no more. So the police have to get involved. And you notice that this is police from the city going out into the hinterland. And we find that a body of 20 police. So this is a pretty large ex uh, expedition, right? Uh, filling two carriages and an automobile set out in the late afternoon with the shivering squatter as a guide. So they get to the end of a road, then they uh, start walking for miles, splashed on in silence through the terrible cypress woods where day never came. We get descriptions of, you know, the fungus islets and depressions and things like that. And then they get to the squatter settlement. A miserable huddle of huts hove in sight. Hysterical dwellers ran out to cluster around the group of bobbing lanterns. So by now it's dark. The muffled beat of tom-toms was now faintly audible, far, far ahead. And a curdling shriek came at infrequent intervals. So they know that there's something going on. A reddish glare seemed to filter through the pale undergrowth beyond endless avenues of forest night. The squatters refused to go any further. So the police press onward. And now they're in this area of evil repute substantially unknown, untraversed by white men. There were legends of a hidden lake unglimpsed by mortal sight in which dwelt a huge formless white polypus thing with luminous eyes. Squatters whispered that batwing devils flew out of caverns in the inner earth to worship it at, at midnight. They said it had been there before D'Aberville, before LaSalle, before the Indians, and before even the wholesome beasts and births, uh, birds of the woods. It was nightmare itself, and to see it was to die, but it made men dream, and so they knew enough to keep away. The present voodoo orgy was indeed on the merest fringe of this abhorred area, but that location was bad enough. So we've actually got kind of a, you know, a little red herring here. There's an even deeper woods with a more dangerous thing, and we never hear anything more about that, but we do hear about the flying things. So what do we uh, find out? So uh, Lagrasse is going to say only poetry or madness could do justice to the noises heard by his men as they plow down through the black morass towards the red glare and the muffled tom-toms. There are vocal qualities peculiar to men, vocal qualities peculiar to beast, and it's terrible to hear the one when the, the source should yield to the other animal fury and orgiastic license here, whip themselves to demonic heights of, by howls and squawking ecstasies, right? So we're, you know, we're getting this sort of depiction of, oh, these, these people have descended to the level of animals, right? And, you know, you could say, well, that's just typical sort of turn of the century Lovecraftian racism, but there's actually something else going on, this worship in progress that they assume to be a voodoo orgy. And it's described that way at first. And what is actually happening? It's so bad that some of his men faint, you know, um, have trouble with, with it. So all stood trembling and nearly hypnotized with terror. Why? In a natural glade of the swamp stood a grassy island of perhaps an acre's extent, clear of trees, tolerably dry. On this now leaped and twisted a more indescribable horde of human abnormality than any but a Syme or Angarola could paint. Void of clothing, this hybrid spawn were braying, bellowing, and writhing about a monstrous ring-shaped bonfire in the center of which, revealed by occasional rifts in the curtain of flame, stood a great granite monolith some eight feet on, in height, on top of which incongruous in its diminutiveness rested the noxious carven statuette, the very statue that Lagrasse is consulting the American Archaeological Society experts about. 
So that's going on. There's all of this worship happening, and one of the men, an excitable Spaniard, fancied he heard antiphonal responses to the ritual from some far and unillumined spot deeper in the woods. So antiphonal means call and response, right? The human beings uh, who are worshiping are making some sort of call. Something else is calling off deeper in the woods. So the police attack the worshipers. The horrified pause of the men was of comparatively brief duration. Duty came first. And duty means let's break this up. So there were nearly a hundred celebrants in the throng. The police replied on their firearms and plunged determinately into the nauseous route. While blows were struck, shots were fired, escapes were made. In the end, Lagrasse was able to count some 47 prisoners, um, who he forced to dress in haste and fall in lines. Five of the worshippers lay dead, and two severely wounded ones were carried away on improvised stretchers. And then they take the image on the monolith. And they find out that these prisoners, you know, um, he says, uh, the, were all men of a very low mixed blood and mentally aberrant type, but they all give consistent answers to Lagrasse's and his, his other men's inquiries about what's going on. It's not voodoo. Something much older, something deeper, something more evil, something more chilling, you could say. And we get this long discussion of the great old ones that we've already discussed elsewhere, so we don't have to go into that any further. But we find that Lagrasse, and here's essentially where his story is going to end, Lagrasse, deeply impressed and not a little bewildered, had inquired in vain concerning the historic affiliations of the cult. So where does he go to? He's in New Orleans. He goes to Tulane University and consults the professors there. They don't have any answers for him. So he goes, once he finds out about this, to the American Archaeological Society, looking for answers, actually gets somewhat of an answer in Professor Webb's narrative of what he encountered many years before. And, you know, this is giving us one set of pieces to the puzzle that this entire story is slowly unveiling before our eyes. We're not actually getting to see Cthulhu himself yet, as we will in the next really important account, but we're getting to see the outlines of the worship that has been inspired by and to even some degree directed by Cthulhu waiting for this world ending, world changing event of his rise and the police get to intervene, but only in a local area as Lagrasse is going to tell us.